It's Gil Alexander. It is Kelly Midland, producer number nine. So much more than the producer. Live from Bar Canada at the D, downtown Las Vegas. What's happening? What's up? What's up? Big night in the NBA, Kill. Big, <laughs> big night, big morning. Uh, by the way, on the show today, speaking of NBA, JVT will join us, talk uh, some NBA awards and beyond. Mm -hmm. we got baseball with Mark Borchard, Jason Weingarten, basketball with Will Hill. Also some baseball from Will, too. Uh, Michael Montesano on, on college hoops as well. Um, usually, though, let me just start here today. Usually my Twitter timeline, my X timeline, whatever you want to call it, I'm never going to get off Twitter, by the way. Aye. Um, Is multiple sports, right? People are throwing baseball, basketball, football, whatever. It's a, it's a potluck. Not last night. Last night, it was nothing but Wembanyama tweets because people expect me to talk about this. <laughs> because as you said, Kelly, now everybody's outraged about this, but you said it yesterday that when I started talking about it, no one was even willing to have a conversation with me yep. on the show. All right, so Victor Wembanyama, this comes on the heels last night of Victor, uh, Victor Wembanyama in a loss to the Nuggets going 23-15-8-9-1. So 23 points, 15 boards, 8 assists, 9 blocks, and 1 steal. He had... In other words, 2 assists and 1 block shy of a quadruple double. A quadruple double. It's coming. It's coming. It's only a matter of time. I thought it was going to be last night. If Ice, if Ice Cube said you mess around and got a triple-double, what do you think you would have said about getting a quadruple-double? I don't know. I, I thought that game was going to go in overtime and he was going to get it. All right, so let me just uh, – here's what I'm going to try to do. I'm going to try to minimize the, the anger, and I'm just going to try to do this by fact. This will probably fail because I'll probably crescendo. Uh, most stocks this season, stocks, the cool term now for steals plus blocks. Victor Wimbanyama has 321 of those. Um – Next is AD with 248. Anthony Davis um, way behind at 248. Wemby's blocks alone would be next at 235, by the way. And then Chet Holmgren back to the stocks at 225. I, you, I mean, the crazy part about that is I don't think the vast majority of those have come in the past two and a half months, too. Where would Rudy Gobert, presumptive defensive player of the year, be, you ask? I know I asked it. 188. By the way, the 252 blocks, by the way, Wemby's at 250, he should be at 252, I think, on on, on blocks, uh, not 235. But the, his blocks alone, maybe it's 235. Get it okay. together, Wemby Muse. Either way, more than the last three defense, no, 252 is, I'm sorry, 252, last three defensive players of the year combined in blocks, 252. Wimbanyama currently with 235. That's the last three defensive player of the years combined in blocks, 252. Wimbanyama with 235. By the way, he's the first player with 200 blocks, 200 plus blocks in a season since Gobert seven years ago. Last player with 300 plus stocks, and remember Wimbanyama has 321 in a season, AD back in the 2017-2018 season. He has more stocks than any of the last nine players in their Defensive Player of the Year winning season. Still six games left in the regular season. By the way, if you wanted advanced metrics, and I don't know that you do need them, but if you did, something called Defensive Box Plus Minus, Wimbanyama 3.2, Gobert 1.7. Basically doubling him up, almost. And then to the question, because these are all counting stats, the question of, oh, yeah, well, how much did they all play? Well, Gobert played 69 games at 34.1 minutes a clip this year. Wembanyama, 67 games at 29.3. I've done the math for us. Gobert's played 389.8 more minutes of basketball than has Wembanyama. By the way, Wembanyama is now, what, 11 to 1 to win Defensive Player of the Year? Like, this thing has gone, it's going the other direction Let's see if that moved than it should be. Last he time. was plus 350. 12 to 1. 12 to 1. Oh, sorry, I sold it short. <laughs> he was plus 350 at some skins, 4 to 1, I think, in legal shops a couple weeks ago, maybe even a week ago. And I'll say this again, and now I'm starting to get angry because I feel it. I feel it getting in me. When he crushes the numbers next year because he's going to play 33 minutes a, a game, let's say, right, instead yeah. of the 29 he's playing now, and the team finishes, I don't know, 18th in defici uh, defensive efficiency, the voters are going to say, oh, well, we got to give the defensive player of the year to win Banyama, and poof, just like that, the whole narrative of, you know, got to be on a top defensive team to get the award is going to vanish in thin air, period. I will be betting him MVP next year at any price. 
I don't care what it opens. I know I know how unlikely it is to win. That game last night was the the peak of where I've seen Wemby's skills get to. And, and yes, it was it had something to do with playing Jokic, but he is he was incredible. He blocked Jokic four times. Four times. He made Jokic dunk three times, which just I'm gonna put it like that because Jokic, Jokic never knows. dunks. He knows. Why does he need to dunk? Yeah. Because there's a tall Frenchman coming to block him. Again. This is not like a disagreement on football awards, you know, Brock Purdy versus Lamar Jackson. Everybody sort of understood each other. And even the people like myself who, who liked Brock, Brock Purdy as the guy using advanced stats, when he had the four interception game, we all waved the white flag. We knew it was over. Same thing with Spencer Strider versus Blake Snell, National League Cy Young last year. Those of us who talked about the advanced stats and how Striders were so much better than Snell's and Snell was a ticking time bomb and Strider just had needed enough time to have for his to manifest it didn't happen and so we understand why it went the way that it did strider didn't even get into the finals finalists this is insanity absolute insanity so i was prepared to come in on the show today and i was i was prepared to say brian windhorse tim bontemps zach lowe all you uh, got awards in this market use your platform for good not evil Chas v'chalila, that you should talk about something besides the lakers and then I find out this morning that Brian Windhorst on, on his pod says he is finally voting for Wimbanyama. There you go, Wendy. I don't know if he went as solid as that, but he, he kind of hinted that's where his vote's going right now. And uh, yes, Tim Bontemps and Tim McMahon were not very happy about it. Chas <laughs> that you should talk about something besides the Lakers. By the way, once again, ladies and gentlemen, I have wrapped up the coveted Sephardic Jewish demographic. <laughs> All right, so the other thing that happened this morning I just don't want to talk about it anymore because it's so ridiculous. It's so ridiculous that he's not the that uh, Wemanyama is not the favorite in this, and that it's going the other direction. I may add more to what I already have. Now, also long awaited, the ESPN NBA MVP straw poll. This is Bon Temps, right? Yeah, this is the final straw poll. This is his thing. Um, there are some things to talk about here. Not not at the top though. Nikola Jokic uh, has a comfortable. 300-ish point lead when you talk about first, second, third, fourth, and fifth place votes. Remember, it is a tiered point system. Uh, Nikola Jokic over Shea Gilgis-Alexander, who just stopped scoring 30 a game. He might be dinged up. Yeah, he is. Um, and so I think that's correct, right? Jokic should win his third in four years. Shea Gilgis is second. Here's where the interesting part comes. Luka's third. By the way, Shea has the most second place votes. Luka has the most third place votes. Obviously, Nikola has the most first place votes. But the interesting thing about Doncic, he has only one first place vote. One. A breadstick for yep. first place. And I don't know, but when I hear people talking about MVP, at least in betting media, they give Luca way more of a chance or have given him right. way more of a chance here. And this says he's got no shot. Yeah, at. it was a Sunday, Monday. The odds completely flipped. You had SGA drift all the way out to like, I mean, he's 20 to 1 right now at DraftKings. Luca got cut down to like 5 plus 550. Um, so, yeah, I would. I, based off of this, I think that, that's one of the biggest things you can learn. No, don't go running to make Luca Doncic bets right now. Giannis is fourth. Got the most fourth place votes. Jason Tatum is fifth. Got the most fifth place votes. All right, whatever. Joke. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, here's where it gets hilarious to me, though. Not Brunson at six, but Anthony Edwards at seven. And the reason that that's funny to me <laughs> is because Michael Wilbon keeps talking about how he's got Anthony Edwards second and always considering it for first. Uh, here's Anthony Edwards line. None in fir no first place votes. One second place vote. I think we know who that is. <laughs> Third, none, fourth, five, fifth, five. So there you are on an island, yeah, Michael Wilbon with Anthony Edwards. Yo, and I both started chuckling as soon as Gil walked in. I didn't even notice it at first. He's like, well, I guess that's where Wilbon's is. I know, I'm like, I know yeah, where probably. Wilbon's voting. <laughs> Kawhi's eighth. DeMonte Sabonis is interesting at ninth. He's yeah. got three fifth place votes on a double double tear. That seems a little we, weak. We've gotten so warped by the the yeah. triple doubles from Jokic and Luca and what Wemby's doing. We haven't rec we haven't given the the true. I and I've been the guy not really jumping in on this too much, but like Sabonis's double double streak, the most since the NBA ABA merger, yeah, is one of the most at least talked about storylines of the NBA season. And just because we don't really care about double doubles anymore, I guess it's really sad to me though that he's. Yeah, look, if I my top five, 
he would be, he would be getting my fifth place vote probably just for Sabotis. recognition yeah. of what he did with that this season. Um, obviously we re, re, we read your tweets, pardon me, throughout the show, but I just want to read this one from Bi Week Picks. So if you use this straw poll as a as sort of a indicator again, again, it's a hundred media, it's a hundred media members, I believe, hundred media members. Not every one of them have votes. Some of them have votes. This, this is really just to give you a rough idea of what the media is looking at, th at this race as. Yeah. And this is this is a good way of doing it. Yes. This is fairly accurate. Uh, by week picks, for instance, says, question uh, to the Futures Masters. I think he's talking about us. I have a substantial wager on Jokic to win the MVP, ra MVP race at about plus 450. Do you see any utility or insurance hedge on Luka? My concern is voter fatigue and Joker sitting some games of late but again and so now that you see this the answer to that would be yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't touch it not for luca anyway i was gonna say i mean if yeah. any if anything maybe you're taking a little bit of, of, of shea at 20 to 1 but only because he's 20 to 1 I, I, I don't even think i'd do anything with the ticket though and isn't this stupid that they took it away from Jokic last year just so he couldn't have three in a row and now he's about, eh, three or four I, eh, that we can live with says the nba voters it's absurd JBT, let's play a little uh, should win, will win with him on all these NBA awards. His thoughts on the NBA tonight and College Hoops Final Four. It's a numbers game at Visa, the Sports Betting Network. v the Sports Betting Network. Start your morning with a daily dose of winning strategies, insider tips, and the latest buzz with the free v daily newsletter in today's newsletter. Well, we got Thule's take on the final four and Masters Primer coming at you. Released this morning at v .com. Check it out. Oh, wow. Get expert analysis, the latest odds delivered straight to your inbox. Absolutely free. Visit v slash newsletter to subscribe. Gil Alexander, Kelly Bidlin. Uh, you see Thule, the picture uh, that they had. Randy McKay and him went to... Uh, Andiamo's last night here at the D and Tuli's plate. They showed his plate like he had a porterhouse and like <laughs> massive gnocchi, and he like ate the whole thing. I think I think he's one of those uh, he's one of those guys that like can tackle like the forty ounce steaks. It's amazing. We get tweets at Beanie Book. I just want to go back to last night. These are all these are all about Wembenyama. Troy Beal. There's no way Wembenyama's fourteen to one in the morning. This is a Joe Flacco fake. He's winning this award from your lips to God, as my mom used to say. The truth, nineteen eighty. I just told my wife that Wemby almost had a quad double, and she replied, Gil is going to be so fired up tomorrow. She knows he's the defensive player of the year. <laughs> I don't know if I believe that. Brandon Fear, nine more blocks for Wemby, hashtag DPOY. Um, this is from Scott, New York Mets. Nine blocks against the defending champs. I cannot wait till his team plays some D so he gets respect. Uh, Ray. Even Jokic knows Wemby is Defensive Player of the Year. Wemby talking about how he blocked him four times last night. Um, I won't even say the name of this gentleman because I don't want to say something wrong. I don't know if this is a conspiracy theory or the actual reason uh, they're no longer on the team. Oh, he's talking about that A's thing. There's four guys with uh, who are wearing paraphernalia supporting some shop that is anti-owners, and those A's, all, all the A's got demoted. Sorry about that. Uh, Jason, I've been uh, taking the team total over for whoever the Rockies are playing. Only lost one so far. Um, guy on VEASAN said to do it when they're at home. Thoughts? Well, no, it'll be adjusted for home, but it's a good thought in general because the Rockies are horrible. Um, Dave sending out Wembanyama things. Jess, Jesse Welch, Wemby, DPOY. Come on, baby, feeling like Joe Flacco come back player of the year dilemma all over again. Anyway, on and on with stuff. Oh, and this is, the, this is my favorite one. Roger Jones. Hi, Gil. Uh, new listener. What do you think of betting this rookie from the Spurs at 12-1 to 1 to win defensive player of the year? He had nine blocks last night. Thanks in advance. Hey, it just keeps going with Wembanyama. JVT joins us, our senior NBA analyst, and of course, the co-host of Prime Primetime with Tim Murray every night here at the network. How you doing, John? What's happening? Uh, I'm good. I'm good. Baseball's here. Uh, basketball season's almost coming to the postseason to college basketball. There's so much going on. My Nashville Predators are red hot. Somebody convinced <laughs> me to better take it on them. Uh, let's go. I'm in. I'm ready to go. That's like me and the Guardians. I'm borrowing them for a month from uh, Adam Burke. That's uh, yep. it's all through our bets. All right, JVT, uh, let us play. Should win, will win. Let's do this with, with uh, NBA awards. Let's start with MVP. 
Uh, okay, should win, and I think they're both the same. Should win and will win will be Nikola Jokic. Uh, look, he's a rightful favorite. The guy has been absolutely incredible yet again. When you look at his numbers, um, the efficiency from the floor, the on-court, off-court numbers, their net rating when he's on the floor, his contributions, yes, and on both ends, he is not, you know, he. I think we've gotten past the point talking about him a minus defender. Uh, should win and will win will be Nikola Jokic. I don't think there's really any argument at this point right now. Yeah, the straw poll that we just talked about from Tim Bontemps uh, oh. con corroborates that. All right, most improved player. I'm interested in your thoughts on this. So I, I think this is a little different. I think should win should be Kobe White. I think when you look at Kobe White and the leap that he has made from his last two seasons in the league, which he took a very strong downturn, was not playing very well, looked like he wasn't going to be a part of Chicago's plans going forward, to the leap that he has made up to this point right now is absolutely incredible. And he's playing at a near all-star level, and it should be part of like a future building block for the Chicago Bulls as we look forward, if he is going to play like this for the rest of his career. Will win is Tyrese Maxey. I don't agree with it. I think when you look at the leap that Tyrese Maxey made from his first to his second year, I don't know why then this leap from last year to this year is considered more most improved. He couldn't win it in his second year because he was a second year player. But I think given where Kobe White was at in his career last season, I think that he should win, but I don't think he will win. The reason we do this is not only to get JVT's opinion, but to capture the disappointment in what we know is coming on <laughs> some of these. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's asinine. Like, oh, they're expected to make a leap. Not that kind of a leap. It's, it's, uh, it's whatever. Coach of the year. Should win. Will this, win. This is interesting. So I think I think should and will are the same guy. Mark Dagnall's awesome. And, and what he's done with this team in terms of having them prepared every, almost every single game, guys. Like, there's not really a letdown for the Oklahoma City Thunder. You know, in recent days, uh, they've kind of had a little bit of a step back, but that's because Shea's been dealing with a quad injury. But this team has not let go of the rope in any way, shape, or form. Being so young and still competing for a one seed, they're well-schemed. They're a top-10 team in both offense and defense. So much of that has to do with what Dagnall does. I think should win and will win is Mark Dagnall. I'll, but I'll throw in a caveat because he is definitely worth mentioning here. Jamal Mosley, I think, is a little bit more live than Chris Finch. What the Orlando Magic have done to get offensive geared players to buy in defensively, to potentially have a, a home court advantage in the Eastern Conference, this seems so well ahead of schedule. Mosley, I think, is, is very live to win this thing. But for me, can and should would be Mark Dagnall. Sixth man. Okay, so this is where I also have some feelings. So I would say <laughs> should win, and I will, I will readily admit that I am biased here. However, when you look at the players that are in the race for this award, when you're talking about the most efficient player by a pretty decent margin in Norman Powell, a guy who closes out games for the Los Angeles Clippers, and like when we're talking about closing games, like in clutch time is playing in these lineups because he is part of the most important lineup for them efficiency-wise. To me, it should be Norman Powell. However, will win it, just judging by what we see in media and people's commentary, it looks like it's going to be Malik Monk. I don't think that I actually, no, I should say, I think that missing this time down the stretch should make a difference because this race is very tight, whether you think it's Malik Monk, Norman Powell, or Nas Reed. But I still think that there are so many people, Gil, who view this award archaically as like, got to be the leading scorer off the bench. When in reality, your role as a six man should be more important than that. In fact, I think guys like Nas Reed should be getting more credit for playing well as a starter because a good sixth man can also fill the role of a starter if needed, Ooh. if somebody is injured. So I think that when you look at it, should win is Norman Powell, but will win is probably going to be Malik Monk because we can't look past scoring off of the bench. Yeah, that six-man thing is a conundrum. With Nas, it's yep. like Nas Reed. I'm sorry, he was a starter. You got to dismiss it. And then JVT yep. saying the opposite. Yeah, like, that was no, the disaster should... last year. Right? Yeah. It was uh, the Brog Brogdon winning because he was the he was the true guy off the bench, yeah. uh, not quickly because he started too many games. Well, Ke and, and Kelly, remember last year? So he quickly had to start one game off the bench down the stretch. He had like 45 points against the Celtics, and people were like, "No, it doesn't count." And it's like. The, uh, what what makes a good backup quarterback? The fact that he could come in and start, right, if needed to be, it's the same thing here. Like, you shouldn't be discounted for making spot starts here and there and performing adequately. I, I think it's such a weird way of thinking about it. Yeah, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. Uh, Ten seconds on clutch player of the year. Some people bet this. <laughs> anything? I mean, uh, uh, let's go DeMar DeRozan because he's the odds-on favorite. Sure. I, I don't know if you want to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Drum roll. Defensive player of the year. All right, so should win it. Derek White. No, uh, I think when you look at <laughs> I, I think when you – I'll say this. 
I think Rudy Gobert, like, I think Victor Wembanyama deserves more credit for what he does defensively. And when you look at his on-court numbers with where the Spurs are at defensively, when he plays, you guys have mentioned the counting stats, blocks and rebounds, and the way that he has impacted this team when he is on the floor, he probably should win defensive player of the year. I also want to state, though, that we should not lose sight of how good Rudy Gobert is defensively. And he is a very big reason why this Minnesota Timberwolves team is leading the league in defensive efficiency at this point right now. But I think if you actually looked at it with some nuance and you talked about literal defensive impact for a team that is as bad in, in, a, in a whole entire picture as the San Antonio Spurs, it probably should be Victor Wembanyama, but Rudy Gobert will win this because there's going to be those old heads. They're going to look at this and go, he's a rookie. He can't win defensive player of the year, and that's what might get you. Old heads. So ridiculous. NBA plays tonight. What do you got? Anything so far? Uh, so no, I've, I've got a couple of things that, that I've got loaded up. We'll see if uh, some of the line moves. Like, for example, um, the Lakers today are playing uh, the Washington Wizards. Both teams coming off second legs of active act. Darvin Ham told the media yesterday that both Anthony Davis and LeBron James are going to play tonight. Uh, LeBron James only uh, got out of the game at like nine minutes left in the fourth quarter. Anthony Davis didn't play in the fourth quarter. So while it's a negative scheduling spot, it's a little bit better for them because they weren't active in that fourth. And unlike the Milwaukee Bucks guys, uh, the Lakers will take an opponent like Washington seriously. They got a plus 8.9 net rating and non-garbage time against bottom teams in terms of net rating. Uh, they are 5-0 and against those teams post-All-Star break with a plus 13 net rating. They take care of business against these bad opponents. So if we get LeBron and Anthony Davis, I've been lied to before, so I want to make sure. Uh, the, the Lakers are going to be a play there. Uh, the other ones that are on the list for me as well, Cleveland taking on Phoenix. Similar situation. Second leg of a back-to-back -back for Cleveland, but Donovan Mitchell didn't play yesterday. They took the night off, so you're going to get him out there. Hasn't been playing particularly well, but with the night off, starting to get his legs back underneath him. I can't figure out Phoenix for the life of me. They go lose to San Antonio, then they go on the road and blow out New Orleans. They're all over the place, but I still think the gap between these two teams, especially when Cleveland's at full strength, is a little bit tighter. So those are the two on the radar right now. And I throw out an honorable mention as well of, uh, what was else was I looking at? Uh, oh, Detroit. Detroit. Uh, I, I took a, a different number. This number's gone, but I think Detroit's pretty live here against Atlanta. I still think it would be playable at about 11 and a half. All right. Sorry to do this to you because we only have 20 seconds, but your thoughts on the two final four games would be? Uh, Purdue. I'm going to wait to see if the number gets cheap, but I'm going to lay this thing with Purdue. You know, eight and a halfs are kind of out there, but Boilermakers, I've been riding the last few rounds. I'm going to do it again. Not touching Alabama and UConn. Uh, no, I don't want to. I want to bet Alabama, but I can't get in front of that train, man. I can't do it. <laughs> JVT, thank you as always. Appreciate it, man. That's great. Good, good to talk to you guys. Thank you. Jonathan Montobel at me, JVT, by the way, on the old Twitter machine. A little rapid fire. Should win, will win. Little baseball on the other side. No one has better numbers than Mark Borchard. We dive in next. A numbers game on VSIN, the sports betting network. For a limited time, we're offering two weeks of our exclusive betting splits for free. That's our betting splits for free. Say it again. Okay, damn it. Just sign up at VSIN.com slash splits. The VSIN betting splits page. Is, there you go. Is updated with DraftKings odds every five minutes so you can see changes in all the action. Find out where the public is betting based on the number of tickets and where the money does not match the public opinion. You can check out not just today's action but future events as well. Take advantage of this limited time offer. Visit VEASAN.com slash splits now to claim your free two-week access to VEASAN's betting splits. Don't strike out on potential winnings. Visit VEASAN.com slash splits and start making smarter baseball bets today. We get tweets at beating the book. Underdoggy one. Staying at the Aria in a few weeks. Can't get into Carbone. What else do you recommend, either at a hotel or nearby? Wife and our wife and I are foodies, so open to anything. Thanks. Uh, in the aria itself, Jean George, very good. Um, catch, if you're into sushi yep. downstairs, very good. Was it Javier's? Right. Javier's yep. is very overpriced, though. It is very overpriced. But that in aria itself, those would be my recommendations. I've uh, had up and down meals there. At where? Javier's. Oh, the food is good. It's just that you just have to bring two wallets. <laughs> you got to pick whose two wallets it is. Uh, this is from, uh, let's see, do, 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 do. Jason H11. Here's an idea for VEASAN. Have the ability to choose a VEASAN pro to follow and get text or email alerts when they post a play. The Gilly rule will help with international events. Got sushi? Uh, Nick, rules for society. 50 to 1, I hate awards voters. 50 to 1 sounds long. Kevin Ryan, minimize the anger by saying that to the bear and the other guest you had lit up the week after FSU got snubbed for the playoffs. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, Forrest, Lim, uh, Forrest Lim was asked about coaches. I think we covered that. Las Vegas 514, yo, get me on the court. I'm in trouble. 
Ice Cube reference, I caught that. Tony, it's over. Joker winning in a landslide. Um, Roger Jones, I think you just swung the vote to Wemby with use of the word poof. Also loved breadstick. Ah, you got it. Bobby Geddes, I wanted a piece of Wemby before the year started and didn't want rookie of the year odds, so I did defensive player of the year, 18 to 1, and all NBA first team, 8 to 1, which per last time I checked wasn't projected to make the all NBA first defensive team either. Blasphemous. Keep preaching, Gill. And then prime time. Gobert's interpreter had a bet on C.J. Stroud to go number one overall, which blocked Gill and Mr. Bin Laden, that's you, Kelly, from winning bets. Render boy from winning defensive player of the year. Wow. Little, uh, little American jingoism right there. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk some baseball with the greatest numbers guy that I know. He's base winner from an undisclosed location somewhere in the desert. It's Mark Borchard, everybody, I'm courtesy of the Progressive Got my Guest Line. My money on my money on my mind. <laughs> I should never step on that. Wow. There we go. Props to the production team on that one. Well, Gil, thank, thank you for the compliment. Coming from the guy who hosts the numbers game, uh, the best numbers guy he knows, I, I'll take that any time of, of the year, Gil. Well, it's true, and I, I, you know that, that I feel that way about you. Let, let us begin. Let's do this opposite. I don't want to wait for your picks. Let's get your picks today because we have day baseball, full day baseball. What do you got today? You know, one of the things that I, I wanted to point out on the show was that the Tampa Bay Rays, and I, I not only do have them priced to win today, I've got them at minus 217. They're minus 117 in the market. You, you look at Savali from a lot of different ways, and, and Savali, his adjusted strikeout percentage last 150 plate appearances, 32.6%. Puts him in the 96th percentile. But one of the things I did want to talk about was was the Rays' ability to win uh, during the day on weekday games, and it was really kind of uncanny. They're 12 and three over the last two years in day games, and so you know I think that uh, for me, uh, with it with the proliferation, if you will, of day ball. Uh, I've, I've got to take a look at those trends. I'm not a huge trend guy for the most part, Gil, but I think with the Rays in Tropicana Field during the day, I think that that's a distinct uh, advantage for them based on the park characteristic, if that makes any sense. Well, right, because some people are going to be listening to me, what are you talking about? It's indoors, so it's clearly not a, it's clearly not a, uh, you know, a thing that has to do with the weather or what are you talking about? It's a body clock thing? No, I'm talking about, you know, the actual sight lines of the park. If, if, you, if you notice, you know, there's so many fly balls that get dropped there during the day. Mm. And I think that that plays into effect. I think it points out two things, really. Uh, you, you want a team, and gosh, this T Tampa Bay Rays, watching them field is beautiful. Really a thing of beauty, watching them play. Uh, but, but also, uh, yeah, that has to play into the sight line for the batter. Uh, there are also some, some issues with the mound there. And, and yeah. I don't know, you know, and, and so, but, but, but the way the, uh, the, the Tampa Bay, the front office and the coaching, uh, a pitching coach, uh, of course, Kevin Cash, the manager, uh, they know how to take advantage of that park. And, and so I think it just is a little bit uh, odd uh, during the day when, when you compare it uh, to other ballparks, you know, for all, most ballparks are outdoors, Gil. Yeah, no, we, it's, um. You know, if you've handicapped baseball long enough, we all run into these sort of things. Remember that guy who, uh, remember the pitcher who used to play for the Royals, Brian Bannister? I'm just sort of off the top of my head. I remember, like, he, he had some ridiculous day-night split also. And I always wondered, is that just completely random, or is there something to that with a guy like that? But you're you're talking about the ballpark itself here with the Rays. Uh, okay, so you're on Tampa Bay. What, what was the actual bet? You're doing a full game money line? What are you doing here? I'm going to play the full game money okay. line. I'm not going to get cute with it. I think that their bullpen is much better than the Texas bullpen. Uh, so that goes into my, my, uh, my, what do you say on your show? Calculus as well. Oh, you're so, <laughs> you're so silver tongued. Yo, I love you. Okay. Uh, what else, what else do you have? Well, I'm, you know, a, a segment wouldn't be complete Gil without the base oh, winner parlay. There it is. And uh, base winner lay the wood parlay. And I'm going to go with Seattle and the Dodgers uh, for that. Uh, and really, uh, I don't think there's any surprise. Tyler Glass now one of my favorite pitchers in baseball, and uh, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of roll the dice a little bit uh, with with Kirby and and the Mariners, uh, and it's not really uh, it, me loving Kirby so much. In fact, if you look at his strikeout percentage, it's below average last 150 plate appearances. Not 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 much below average, but in the 49th percentile. But Logan T. Allen does not score well in, in a lot of categories uh, in my model. In fact, 
his his strikeout percentage 19.5 percent and then his stuff plus number is 20 percent and this stuff plus number uh compares 11 metrics it was developed by eno saris anyway his uh his stuff plus number the 20th percentile and george kirby's in the 85th percentile and i think offensively if you look at the two teams i, I do like the the seattle offense a little bit better than the cleveland offense i've got seattle ranked number nine in baseball uh with against the comparative split uh, versus Cleveland at number 16. So I'm going to go ahead and take Seattle and the Dodgers. And it, it, when they win, Gil, it's going to pay plus 139 on, on a parlay. Plus 139 on a base winner parlay. I've never said this to you before, uh, Mark, on these, but I hope you lose this because I have a March-April bet on the Guardians to have the most wins. So I need them to uh, win a game like this. So... Um, I love it, though. Let, let, let's be honest. Not a yeah. good luck. Like, hey, I've got a bet, too. And you know what? A lot <laughs> yeah. of people feel like that. So I'm glad you actually said that. No, me. no, no. If I didn't have a bet, I'd hope you'd, I'd hope you'd win. But we're oppo in, in terms of uh, our different bets on this one. Um, by the way, Shane Bieber for the Guardians last night, really solid. He's double digits still to win the Cy Young. Not still. Obviously, we've only played a few games here. But he is available still at, uh, at double digits. Was that enough of a performance last night where it sort of at least – raised your antenna about him oh absolutely uh, for sure i i have in fact in my group of five i've got scubal bieber efflin savali and pavetta and uh, i was really happy that i included bieber in that you know one of the things and i want to give props to adam burke uh, at your network he he's, he's amazing one of the guys yeah yeah he's one of the guys and, and, and as a an, an guy in the industry who's been really spending half his adult life handicapping baseball it's really refreshing uh, to see other handicappers that you can really learn from. And, and that was one of the things that, that was in the back of my mind, at least subjectively. Of course, Bieber's numbers were good, too, uh, that put him into that group of five for the Cy Young. But I got him at 25 to one. I, I love it, Gil. Yeah. And, and uh, let me just say, because every I love every opportunity to talk about Adam Burke. He writes the best. And this is this predates Visa, as you said. Now he's the glue that holds it all together here. But he writes, I've said this many times, the greatest baseball write-ups you will ever see on any level ever, period. Um, and so any shout-out to him on, on baseball and beyond, but baseball specifically, uh, is absolutely deserved. And I, I, cannot, I cannot echo that enough. Well, you know, I just real quickly want to say that your recap of your daily plays was is is my gold <laughs> standard. And I missed that. I, I don't miss the plays. I missed the recap. Of the play. No, I missed the plays too. Your plays were good too. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, the recaps when I was at Dr. Bob is what you're referring to. Oh, yeah. they were great. Oh, That's it was just, so it funny. Was one, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Last thing, because we'll have 30 seconds. Um, give me something that you've seen in the first week of baseball where you're like, oh, okay, I need to pay attention to that. Good or bad. I'll let Let's keep it with the Dodgers here because this Bobby Miller, gosh, he looked electric when I watched him. And uh, I think that that guy could be the key to the Dodgers success. 52% strikeout uh, rate in his first start. And then one thing I wanted to point out, if I could maybe do it real quickly, is Kopik last night, he was able to get the Braves and, and close them out last night. But gosh, he's throwing everything up in the zone, hard fastball. If you could find maybe an in-game opportunity to find a team that hits that hard fastball up in the zone really well, that could be an opportunity for an in-game play for you guys. All right. He liked my recaps, Kelly. He liked my 2012 and he liked my 2012 and 2014 seasons. I'll tell you that. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate it. Well, absolutely, Gil. You're, you're I think you're one of the best ha baseball handicappers around. Oh, you don't have to say that. Thank you, Mark. Mark Borchard, everybody at base winner. Will Hill is next with all his plays. A numbers game on v the sports betting network. There's never been a better time to have skin in the game with DraftKings Sportsbook because right now we have a v exclusive offer for new DraftKings customers. Earn a $500 bonus bet for every $1,000 you wager. You can earn up to $2,500 worth of bonus bets in your first three days on DraftKings. Do not wait. Download the app now. Use code ANG when you sign up and earn a $500 bonus bet for every $1,000 you wager now. Quite a deal. Gil Alexander, Kelly Bidlin, live from Barcanada, the Barrage, here at the D, downtown Las Vegas. Uh, Kelly, it was, uh, MGM actually tweeted this out earlier in the week, talking about the final four spreads. So UConn, currently favored by 12 against Alabama in the nightcap, and then Purdue, currently favored by nine over NC State, or nine and a half. We have two of the top five Final four spreads of all time. Talking about semifinal spreads now of all time. Yeah. Number one, 
Can you guess? Or you already I'm saw looking it? You at it right saw it. now. All right. 2021, Gonzaga, 14-point favorites over UCLA in the semis in 2021. Remember, that was the game that went to overtime, and Jalen Suggs hit the banked three. I, I feel like I remember all, all every single one of these games you're about to list. I remember all which but one. Which is weird for me. I remember all but one. Well, there's only three uh, besides the ones that Yeah, it's have. still weird for me. <laughs> <laughs> so Gonzaga was favored by two touchdowns. Jalen Suggs banked in the three in overtime to win it for Gonzaga. Gonzaga went on to lose to Baylor, so they didn't come near covering that one at 14. Um, UNC over Syracuse, the 2016 semifinals, uh, they were favored by 10. That's the third largest spread. So UConn-Alabama is the second largest semifinal spread of all time uh, at 12 right now. UNC, 10-point favorites over Syracuse back in 2016. That was the semifinals where both UNC and Villanova crushed their opponents. And then Chris Jenkins hit the game winner at the right. buzzer to beat UNC yeah, in the finals. Yeah, yep. But UNC did cover that game. I think they won by 17. Um, and the only other one in the top five, because this uh, Purdue-NC State game is also in the top five where it's lined, but the only other one that was tied with that was 2013. This one I don't remember. Louisville was a nine-and-a-half-point favorite over Wichita State over the Shockers in the semis. Uh, Louisville did go on to win the title, and that was the year. The, the, mo the thing that people will remember most from that year is Kevin Ware's gruesome injury in the oh. regional final. Ugh. But I don't remember that game. Man, it's been like 11 years now. Uh, That's crazy. It's just, yeah. Will Hill joins us, everybody. He is the host of the Should Have Bet More podcast, in addition to being uh, one of the Chris Felica Bear Bets podcast cast, if you will, courtesy of the Progressive Guest Line. How you doing, Will? Gilly, what's going on? You actually uh, just had a, a new Should Have Bet More drop this morning. Todd Wishnev, I don't know if you're familiar with hmm. Todd. Oh. Uh, he was very good on the pod. Such a baby about booking him, though. I, I'll come on. Uh, I don't want to come on if you need me, but I don't baby. want to. Okay, I'll do it. And then he comes on, and he was he was really good. So he's, he's a, a total baby. It, that's his script. Yeah, it, his script. I asked, him, I asked him to come on. He's like, do you really need me? I'm like, yeah, Todd, it'd be great. Well, if you can't find anybody else. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's like, uh, exactly. You were going to say something? I'm sorry uh, I interrupted you. Yeah. No, uh, UCLA Gonzaga, I believe UCLA was up two with the ball with like eight or nine seconds left. And there was like a borderline yes. block charge call that went the Zags yes. way. And the Zags tied it and forced overtime. So UCLA really let that game get away. Well, I think it was tied. Yeah, no, no, you're right. It was tied. And you, yeah, that's right. It was a borderline block charge that went against UCLA. And then it just went to overtime. Like Gonzaga didn't really get off a good shot, I think, after that. Because uh, there's only a tick or, or tick or two left. Where do you stand on these two games this weekend? How are you betting them? So I liked NC State last week against Marquette and against Duke. I just thought there was too many points. I had them in the title game against NC. So I've been on them a few times. This is the thing in sports betting where it's like you, know, you bet on a team and they're good to you. It's a knowing when to jump off. You don't want to stay on too long. And I, I get the sense this is the time to jump off. I just I don't know how NC State keeps Burns out of foul trouble. Uh, and if you take him off the court, I mean, he's such a good passer. He's so good again, ar around the basket that their offense will really fall off. And, and the whistle is obviously going to be so important in any Purdue game. And I just don't know how Burns gets his shot off cleanly on the other end. And we're talking, Edie's got a good seven, eight inches on him. Uh, if Burns is just, if he's in foul trouble, if he can't get a shot off, I just, I don't, like, I don't love lane nine, but I, I could see a Purdue runaway here. And you, know, you start having a double Edie and that leaves three point shooters up. I just, Except for the, uh, the the 1983 NC State team, it, it Cinderella usually doesn't win this tournament. The FAUs, the Butlers, the George Masons, they, it's the, the the clock usually strikes midnight for these Cinderellas. So I'm uh, I'm looking to lay it with Purdue. I would actually look to take it with Bama. I mean, how could you be? How could you take bet it. against UConn with any sort of conviction? Here's what I'll do though. I'll, I'll do a little bit of a cop out. It's at 12 now. I'm very confident we'll get a 12 and a half. I wouldn't be surprised if we're getting a 13. These books. They've been getting killed on these favorites. So, I mean, NC State was the only favorite to cover Elite Eight weekend. I'm sure that the books were very happy with NC State to break up the monotony of the money line parlays. They've been getting killed on UConn games. So, as we get closer to tip off, you know, the recreational better that looks at it says, oh, UConn's about to start. They've been free money for me. I'm going to put my you know, 50, 100 bucks on them. I think those bets start to add up and we get a 12 and a half. We get maybe even a 13. So, I'll probably bet Bama just because I think the line is a little bit inflated and it'll probably still go up. Oh boy, you never want to use the do theory, the do fallacy. At some point, you figure UConn's going to be in a tight <laughs> game. At some point this century, maybe yeah. uh, in this tournament, and Bama can maybe, you know, we're probably going to shoot 40, 42 threes. Can they knock down 17, 18 of them? I, I think if you're Bama, I, I've been saying this, if you're serious about winning the game, 
Go up 12 to 4. Go up 16 to 7. Make UConn look up at the scoreboard and wow, we're down eight, nine points. They haven't been through that. Tied against Illinois 23 all, but they haven't felt that game pressure. So if you're serious about winning, maybe they get a little tight, maybe you can get a lead. Uh, again, I just I think this is a little bit inflated. I know Bama's gonna have all sorts of issues keeping UConn off the, the offensive glass. They're not going to have an answer for Klingon, not going to have an answer for the pick and roll. They're going to put them on the line. I get all of that. It's just, it's a it's a hell of a lot of points. You figure at some point, uh, UConn's going to be in a tight game sometime this millennium. Since I disliked both of your answers immensely, Will, uh, well, let me try this a different way. If I come, you like Bama. I thought you liked Bama. No, I do like Bama, you do, but you're waiting okay. for 12 and a half. I wanted, uh, I wanted something more dramatic. Oh, so, money lines? So, no, if I say, yeah. Alternate yeah. line, minus 12 and a half? Uh, let me ask a question. Uh, <laughs> if, if I come to you from the future and I say, hey, one of these underdogs won outright, which one is it and how did they do it? Bama because of the three-point okay. variance. There you go. There you go. All right, baseball. Um, you got to be happy about your Yankees despite the loss yesterday. Yes. Yeah, they, they're, they're much better on offense. I thought they'd be much better on offense. I still don't love the starting pitching. I still don't trust Holmes at the end of the game, but a, a lot more left-handed, a lot more balanced, more speed. They've been so stale the past few years. Too right-handed, too slow, too unathletic. You know, a bunch of strikeouts, a bunch of double plays. They're a balanced lineup. It's a deep lineup. They can run a little bit. They're athletic. Uh, obviously, Soto's one of the best hitters on the planet, and Judge hasn't even gotten going yet. It's funny. Uh, you look at all the players. I know we're only a weekend, but the list of players that haven't homered yet, it's Judge, it's Otani, it's Acuna. There's a bunch of big-name guys that haven't gotten off the schneid. But, yeah, they're much better. And, actually, uh, I like them today. I think they're laying minus 110, minus 115 in that range against Kelly with Rodon going. I actually like them today. Anything else besides the Yanks today? Baseball? Full day. Under first five Orioles Royals, there was a four minus 125 faraway places. It's mostly three and a half at plus money. That's a big difference. You obviously, uh, when you're dealing with with those kind of numbers, it's thinner margins. Two two, you want to push instead of win. So shop around, but uh, I'm still okay with the three and a half under at plus money with uh, Reagan's going against Burns. Two guys right at the top of the uh, of the Cy Young board in terms of the odds. Reagan's was very impressive his first game, and so was Burns. So I, I look at this as like a one one game after five. I, I like the under here. I will say this though, I'm trying to I'm trying to shop around and, and get at this angle. Uh, I'll just read off the games that are jeopardized by rain because you can find some good angles in terms of betting the under for pitchers out, pitcher strikeouts because Ooh, sometimes like. the game can start. Yeah. You play three innings, the rain comes, an hour later, you know the game restarts and the pitchers are out. So here are the games: it is Mets, Cubs, White Sox, Braves, Reds, Phillies, Orioles, Royals, Cubs, Rockies, all rain threats. So keep that in mind. Some of them, the books, I think, I, I seen DraftKings, they had numbers up for the pitchers. They're starting to take them down, saying, oh, wait a second. We don't we don't want to go down this road where, you know, you put up these these over-under for Ks and outs. Sometimes these books put up uh, under uh, alternate unders where you can really get a jumbo payout. So just keep that in mind. If nothing else, maybe it keeps you off the overs, but those are all games where uh, rain could be an issue. It's a great call. There's nothing worse in betting. Um, I'm sure someone will have a vote for something else, but there, there certainly is nothing that is vastly worse than having a pre-flop play in baseball, you're back in a pitcher, and then, you know, five outs into the game, the umps have tried to stave this off as long as they could, but they decided to start it, and then they were like, ah, I'm sorry, we can't play it. And then it's like, a, you know, like Will said, two-hour, three-hour delay. Yeah. The game resumes. Those guys can't go anymore. So you, you have a bet locked into something you weren't betting. Well, and, and what, and run line bets, right, go to die? Right, if if a rain delay in, in in a certain amount of time, what's the rule with those? Got to be a full game. Braves the other day were up nine nothing, top of the ninth against the White Sox. They they banged out the game. They they called it in the top of the ninth, and uh, most books refunded. One last, we got thirty seconds. Give me a Will Hill bet that you currently have that you are most happy about across all sports. Got Indiana State to win the NIT. I'm excited, but I add, I'll give you one I added because that's that's kind of a pass post. Pirates to win the division plus 950. That's a fun one. A lot of young talent. Mediocre division. Why can't the Pirates win like 86, 87 games steal that division? Pirates, yeah. Pirates to win the NL Central. I would give you the $40 fine for the NIT pass post, but you actually said that, I believe, before the uh, tournament itself. Yes. Where does that money go, this fine money with Fez assessment? Uh, I think Steve Fezzik just hoards it, I think, is what happens. Pretty sure. Yeah. Towards it. That's what that guy does. Will, thank you. Dragon. Appreciate it. All right, see you guys. At not the Will Hill. Shoulda bet more is the name of the podcast, by the way. Shoulda bet more. Todd Wishnev, latest guest. We'll come back. Jason Weingarten and more next.